Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Voice of Authority webinar. Uh, my name is Toby Fox. I'm the Managing Director at FreeFox, the marketing agency for councils. And since 2004, we've been running over 30 events a year, bringing councils and the development community together. And during lockdown, we've been doing that by organising these webinars, uh, now twice a week. Uh, on Tuesday, uh, next week, we're going to be starting a new thread around culture and placemaking, asking how are the ways that we design and shape places being altered by changes to the way we consume culture during and after the pandemic? And that's going to be really interesting. Uh, we'll be back this time next Thursday to look at how councils can help make development healthy. Uh, to register, um, look out for our email newsletters uh, or visit the voiceofauthority.co.uk. At that website, you can also browse through our webinar archive and you'll see from the 21st of May a session entitled What Does Recovery Look Like for Our Core Cities? During that session, Mayor of Bristol Marvin Rees highlighted the importance of councils incorporating United Nations Sustainable Development Goals into their recovery strands. And today, in partnership with our sponsor, Mott McDonald, we want to unpack that for you. What are the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs? Um, we want to look in particular at four of them. Uh, we're going to uh, pay particular attention to economic growth, to industry, innovation and infrastructure, to sustainable cities and communities, and to partnerships. We want to know what use they are in guiding recovery. Are cities actually making use of them? And if so, what do they mean in practice? To answer those questions, we're working with Mott McDonald and we've assembled a fantastic panel for you today. We are absolutely packed with talent and experience and knowledge to share with you. We're going to lead off with Councillor James Lewis, Deputy Leader uh, at Leeds City Council. Good morning, James. We're going to also be speaking with Councillor Sam Webster, the portfolio holder for finance, growth and the city centre at Nottingham City Council. Good morning, Sam. Morning. We're also going to be joining Henry Murison, who's director of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership. Good morning, Henry. Good morning. And Maria Mashenkosis, who is director of Midlands Connect. Good morning, Maria. Good morning. And finally, we'll turn to Luke Strickland, who is Environment and Sustainability Lead at Mott McDonald. Hello, Luke. Good morning. Great stuff. Now, we're going to ask each of our panel to spend a few minutes to set the scene for us this morning, uh, which we're going to hope, which we hope will inspire you, our viewers, to use your Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to probe them with searching questions. And the panel's going to spend the second half of this session answering the most popular of those questions. So to stir you and stimulate you. It's now over to our panel. No pressure at all. Councillor Lewis, as we turn to you and we ask, what are the top three priorities for Leeds as a core city post lockdown to encourage economic growth? And how are those goals guided by the UN Sustainable Cities goals? Good morning, everybody. I'm um, James Lewis, Deputy Leader of Leeds City Council. I think our three biggest priorities post lockdown to bring the economy forward in Leeds is first of all we need to really make sure the innovation we've seen in our economy over recent decades continues so we've got one of the strongest digital sectors um, in, 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 in the country um, we've got a strong modern manufacturing sector in Leeds and the wider uh, West Yorkshire economy we need to make sure that the innovation and th that we've seen over decades to come and actually we've seen a lot of just in recent weeks during lockdown continues after that and some of the things we need to make sure that happens is we need to make sure we've got um, the finance of um, um, the finance available we work with an organization called North Invest to make finance available and I know they've been continuing to do it in other organizations and we also need to make sure um, that as public institutions come through uh, both the lockdown period and the consequences of COVID-19 we still have strong universities um, alongside a, a strong public sector. That's an important part for our um, innovation sector. And again, we've um, got a really strong inclusive growth strategy in Leeds to make sure the benefits of economic growth uh, reach out to everybody in our city. And that for us uh, takes me on to our second priority, which is to make sure we are um, 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 to make sure we're bringing jobs and green jobs into the um, economy. I think research has shown that the lowest earners are twice as likely to either be made unemployed completely or furloughed um, during the lockdown. So we want to make sure that the opportunities for 
jobs and green jobs are there. I know overall in, in, in the labour market, we want to uh, see um, strong, um, um, strong apprenticeships and strong training um, come forward to make sure everybody's included. Specifically around the green jobs agenda, which I think links in re um, really strongly with the sustainable development goals agenda. Um, we've done some work in Leeds on things like home insulation, which are really important for people that might live in um, older, less energy efficient homes, but also in terms of creating uh, jobs and be able to create jobs fairly quickly. The installation of energy efficient measures is one that does generate jobs. We've also looked at things like um, um, developing green energy uh, across a number of ways. You've got a district heating scheme based off our waste incinerator plant. Um, and we're looking again because we recognise that, that um, um, there's a strong, uh, um, a, a, a strong movement around a lot of the green agenda at the moment. Like many councils, we adopted the climate emergency. And we're looking at new forms of finance for that, non-traditional forms like green um, like green bonds, uh, where people can choose rather than investing in a uh, financial institution, they can invest in a green municipal bond to bring green energy forward. So we're always, again, we're coming out of lockdown, but we're also coming out of 10 years of austerity for local government. So we're always looking for uh, new forms of sustainable finance to um, take us forward. And the third and final point I think is really important for us, in, particularly in Leeds, is, is, is continuing devolution. Um, we're hoping we're consulting at the moment on the West Yorkshire devolution deal, which will create a West Yorkshire mayor and mayoral combined authority. Um, and hopefully we'll, the election will be next, um, next May, May 2021. And devolution is really important for us. It, it, it is a method we see for getting long term financial commitment to delivering improved infrastructure. Um, we look to see it as a way to be able to actually um, direct the resources of, of both national government and local government on the skills agenda in a really targeted way to West Yorkshire and actually having the freedoms that come with devolution so we're able to set a, a plan and programme for the years ahead and get on with it and we're not constantly going backwards and forwards to London um, to see um, um, government ministers and officials for what are relatively small um, um, projects and funding projects so I think that's really um, important for us. I think one of the things that's a bit unspoken in devolution at the moment, but is really important going forward, is how post Brexit um, we look at the, the 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 funds that we currently get from the European Union um, that the national government has promised to redistribute. How they will be distributed. So, for example, we've got a scheme we run between Leeds and Bradford councils for young people who are furthest from the labour market um, to bring them into uh, training, apprenticeships and jobs, which again is funded by um, the European Union at the moment. We want to make sure, as well as getting a devolution deal in place, um, we're looking at getting a strong financial settlement so schemes like that can continue and continue to deliver for our, um, for our region. Fantastic, James. Thank you very much. I think uh, in, in, in 11 weeks of, of webinars, that's only the second time that the, the B word has been mentioned. Uh, which which just goes to show how how dramatically the agenda has been changed uh, over over the last couple of months. Um, but yeah, Brexit is beginning to impinge again, isn't it? Um, Sam, Councillor Webster, um, let's dig a bit deeper into 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 one of those um, one of the aspects that James brought up. Um, looking at the economic growth strand, as we consider the fallout of of COVID nineteen and the economic Im implications, how ca how can you encourage? and indeed ensure that growth creates job opportunities, particularly for, for the young? Well, I think, um, I mean, I, I, there's lots of similarities with the things that James has just mentioned. <clears throat> Obviously, we're both, um, Leeds and Nottingham are both core cities. There are lots of differences, but also lots of similarities. So a lot of what he said um, made sense to me, and uh, I, can, I can relate to some of the uh, some of the themes that he, he talked about. I think that, you know, many things have changed in a very short period of time. <clears throat> and we have to kind of understand what those, what those changes are and what they mean for us going forward. And importantly, what they mean for our younger citizens, uh, young people who are still, um, well, at school, not all of them are at school at the moment, of course, but still are, um, supposedly attending school. Uh, college and university. I mean, Nottingham is a big university city. We have two very successful, world-renowned universities here, and they are they are in many ways the beating heart of our city. They bring lots of uh, talent into the city, but lots of people from abroad and lots of people from other parts of the country. I think there's a big difference with our own 
our own young people who were born and bred uh, in, in either the city of Nottingham or in, in great, Greater Nottingham, and making sure that opportunities um, go to those young people as well. We've, we've always had challenges in terms of educational outcomes. Uh, and I've worked in the apprenticeships and, and, and training sector myself before, before I was a counsellor, so I'm kind of well aware of lots of the, lots of the challenges. Uh, apprenticeships, for instance, are very important uh, to us. Uh, at the council, we, we recruit about 120 apprentices every year. Uh, whether we'll be able to continue doing that, um, given the financial challenges that we face, uh, as James said, at the end of 10 years of austerity, but also because of the additional kind of pressures and costs of, of COVID as well, um, that would be one of our top asks of government in terms of returning unspent apprenticeship levy funding to either cities or to uh, local enterprise partnerships or regions because that's uh, kept centrally uh, at the moment. Green growth is important to us as well so um, we've been very ambitious in terms of our uh, green credentials. We want to be the first city in the UK to be carbon neutral by 2028 so we've been doing a hell of a lot of work on, on that agenda. Um, as James mentioned as well retrofitting of housing um, sustainable transport is very important to us. So we've got the uh, world's largest fleet of uh, biogas buses. We publicly own the bus company still in Nottingham. So uh, there's lots of opportunities for us in terms of green growth. But I'm not sure whether the training and education sector is fully um, linked into that at the moment or properly uh, adequately funded or has the right expertise and skills within the education sector to help young people uh, move into, into those kind of green jobs in the future. And I think we need to, we need to focus uh, more on that. I've noticed, for instance, with retrofitting of housing, how there are, um, there's a lack of kind of developed businesses in that, in that sector, which causes problems for us. There's a lack of innovation and enterprise in the, in the country because uh, maybe because of uh, decisions that government's taken in the past about research and development funding, about investment in that area as well. So we're somewhat reliant on uh, other countries for uh, some of that growth. I think that, that needs to improve uh, going forward. But that's, that's a big area for us. So I'd say about skills, uh, capacity in terms of bringing young people into those sectors in the future is, uh, is a challenge as well. So yeah, one of, one of my top asks would be around the apprenticeship uh, levy and also in terms of new city deals. We had successful city deals in the past. I think we need to reopen a conversation with government uh, for all of the core cities, not only the ones that have devolution deals because we, we don't all have devolution deals or even combined authority status uh, at the moment. So it's important that government recognises that. But we do need, I think, a new deal going forward to come out of uh, the coronavirus crisis because what was what started as a public health crisis um, could quickly become and looks as though it is becoming an economic crisis. And I think the government needs to respond to that challenge with, with core cities in particular as the drivers of the uh, economy in the country. Well said, Sam. Well said. Yeah. Um, that, that's a perfect segue into, into, into our next section, actually. But, but just before we, we leap into that, uh, viewers, I'm, I'm going to start a, a poll now. Um, we've, we've got four questions, I think, that we're going to put to you. They're mostly uh, yes or no questions or simple you know, preference questions. Um, but if you can respond to those, then they'll feed uh, the report that we put together from this session um, and make available to you over the next few days um, and also may feed into the discussion uh, later on. So we'll start that off uh, now while we turn to Henry and say, and partnerships with government, uh, that, that, that's just been um, uh, looked at by, by, by Councillor Webster. Um, as director of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership, Goal 17 is, uh, is where we want you to focus your attention. And, and Goal 17 uh, and the UN SDGs uh, describes the importance of partnerships in achieving all the other goals. And it's really explicit in the need for shared priorities to make those partnerships work. So in that light, how can core cities partner with each other to, to reap the benefits of, of economic growth? And has the pandemic created new challenges to those partnerships, uh, both within the core cities and between core cities and, and government? Well, and I think it's worth reflecting that the kind of northern powerhouse ambition emerged from the, the report done by Jim O'Neill that was commissioned by core cities uh, and the RSA a number of years ago. And that concept that you could bring together 
the aspirations of our kind of cities to in, unlock economic growth by working collaboratively was a bottom up rather than a top down imposition. And I think that's quite an important principle in certainly how I approach the work I do, that, that in reality, if it wasn't for the five core cities in the, the north of England, the core cities network chaired uh, now still by, by Councillor Judith Blake currently, there would, there would be no such thing as the Northern Powerhouse because it was an idea that came, came from local government. And the then Conservative Chancellor George Osborne, who remains our chair, adopted it. But he was, he was very clear that he was, he was nicking it uh, as an idea that had come from outside of government. And I think that's the, the challenge around the capacity we have in the UK to respond to crises like the one we're currently experiencing. And I, I reflect probably on the health challenges and how centralised our health system is. Uh, James's colleague, his, his chief exec, Tom Reardon, has been off trying to help uh, government and the NHS to, to include better the local capacity we have in our track and trace system is a great example of, of something that can be done in that spirit. But in, in reality, many of our institutions that have been at the heart of responding to this crisis are heavily centralised and we have not uh, made best use of our capacity outside of uh, the centre. And, and I think that kind of bureaucratic top down approach to policy making uh, in, in fields like health has been demonstrated to not necessarily be the right way of approaching things. So we're, we're clearly big fans of devolution. That devolution takes different forms in different places. In Greater Manchester, it includes health uh, policy, and that enables you to, to use those tools in a different way. In other areas, it, it doesn't even include transport. So for some very uh, local reasons, uh, which as a former resident and, and kind of uh, political uh, person in that part of my life in the northeast of England, I understand well why in, in time and we're devolution doesn't include transport but these different powers that have been given in different areas are really just a start and the thing that we particularly campaign for and advocate is the case for city regions not just in the north but across the country to be able to take more control and powers that they need um, and I think that the the reality of the West Yorkshire devolution deal that James mentioned that's out for consultation is that it will enable uh, West Yorkshire to respond much more effectively to the response to this crisis and to, to lead the recovery than if it was left to local individual authorities to try and come to an agreement with government bilaterally. So the, 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 the benefit of the network of, of mayors, which already includes uh, the uh, chair of the combined authority in West Yorkshire, because it, it will be a mayoral authority in the future, that group of mayors that meets across the country uh, clearly has a significant influence over government policy in a way that local government, despite the fact that many of its services have been directly at issue during this crisis, hasn't had. And I think what that speaks to is a need to ensure that we understand the, the role still of our existing civic institutions. And as we layer on new institutions to enable collaboration, we don't forget that actually, as well as the primacy of city regions above any kind of northern vision, which is very much something that's built into Maria's model as part of the Midlands engine, I'm sure she'll, she'll maybe cover that in her remarks. The reality as well is that, that local government needs to remain and be invested in, as well as the strategic tier at a city region level, and at the level, say, of a Cumbria or um, places like the North Bank of the Humber or Cheshire and Warrington that also aspire to devolution. Because if you hollow out the capacity of local government, which in the end is the delivery engine for most of the projects you want to do, even if you have more capacity to think at the level of a city region and deal with those wider trends and issues, you then lose the ability to respond to them. Yeah. And so I think there is a real, a real opportunity for business in particular, so we're a business-led partnership, to support the case for devolution and decentralisation. In the case of education, we've been working very hard to bring business into the education debate to make the case for some of the most disadvantaged schools in the north and across the country, including in places like the West Midlands, to get the support they need. Because actually it isn't just the job of local elected political leaders to advocate for the places that they represent. I think it's incumbent on all of us who have a role in the economies that we live and work in to play a positive part in demonstrating where investment needs to go. And I think the key kind of missed opportunity is that as long as policy making is done from Whitehall, whether it's in health or education, you miss the ability to embed those key drivers of both productivity and quality of life and wider well-being from so many of the other tools that already do sit at the level of place. And so whether it comes to integrating skills policy to deal with the crisis, whether it includes an approach on how we unlock digital infrastructure alongside physical infrastructure in our, our communities, as part of our power up the North plan, we've been very clear 
um, with government what needs to be done and we're doing more detailed work in advance of the budget next month to demonstrate some of the practical steps that the recovery could be shaped around and I think all of those rely on a uh, on the bandwidth that comes from trusting places whether that be through devolution or directly to local government to take more responsibility for some of the things that need to be done yeah and I think the, the real challenge is that that having such a centralized country has been a a real inhibitor of our ability to respond to this crisis it can't be allowed to stand in the way of the recovery as well uh, there's a there's a real there's a real theme emerging here um and, and perhaps it's a slightly self-selecting uh, panel in, in in that sense um but yeah um, local decision making uh, is, is clearly a, a strong theme um and and just to interject and, and answer one of our, our viewers questions uh, matthew um the uh, full details of the viewer numbers and who's answered what questions and how many people are attending and and, and um taking part in the polls and so on will all be presented in the report that follows uh, this session. It takes us a few days to put that together, but it'll be published on the voiceofauthority.co.uk and um, promoted through social media channels. Now, let's turn to Maria uh, and Midlands Connect and goal nine. Goal nine uh, of the SDGs is all about infrastructure, Maria, the improvement of which is your purpose at Midlands Connect. But um, has coronavirus thrown up a couple of new challenges to you? Um, firstly, in the sense of a drain on, on funding that might otherwise have been put into improving road and, and rail infrastructure, which is, which is your, your cause. And secondly, in the focus that the pandemic has put on, on digital connectivity rather than traditional physical uh, modes. So uh, in simple terms, will people need to travel as much as they did? Well, yes, uh, there's no doubt that the whole coronavirus has created huge challenges to the transport sector in particular when it comes to infrastructure but also actually some opportunities and uh, i would like to stress that too um, so in terms of the funding you're right um, we've been actually quite pleased with how government has always throughout the crisis made the point that uh, like history history has showed us um, investment in infrastructure is always a very good tool to um, economic recovery and um, is, is, is what type of infrastructure you choose to invest obviously that is, is going to be extremely extremely important. We also very pleased that government keeps talking still regardless of the virus of leveling up uh, and that's something that we need to uh, make sure that in whatever thinking is taking place and we want to be part of that thinking by the way picking up on Henry's point uh, in terms of what type of infrastructure we want to invest in the next not short term but medium to long term and that's when Midlands Connect comes into play what do we do now to help meet the needs socially but also from a green agenda in the next five to ten years so what type of infrastructure we want government to start investing now now as you can see the coronavirus has brought massive dip in the in the use of public transport and there's a lot of people out there that are saying we're not going to need to travel as much in the future well part personally I'm hating this uh, setup that we've seen at the moment. Of course, technology has shown that we can do things much effectively and that can help productivity levels in many, many ways. But we do miss our social interaction. The need for travel, for connect with new places, with new markets, I believe, and again, history has shown that after major crisis globally, people tend, the demand comes back. People are eager to connect to new places, to new people, to make new uh, uh, acquaintances. So I'm confident that people will uh, still then rely and will depend and will require and will expect a much improved public transport network and, and in fact they will want that to be the most sustainable transport network that there is. Um, now there is an opportunity at the moment that unless we invest now in infrastructure in that thinking um, we're going to have a major risk that we might not be able to influence the change in behavior that we're seeing at the moment. So at the moment people are being told to stay at home, they're actually being told to use the car instead of public transport. This is going to affect a lot of the behaviour um, um, expectations for the future. So unless investment takes place now, there is a risk that we will be missing a huge opportunity to get people to get excited still about making the right choices, to get the right decisions and to always still choose public transport as the first choice when it comes to it. 
Um, so I hope that helps in terms of making the case for investment in transport in parallel to digital, uh, I will say. Um, and that's why we also quite excited with um, the, the HS2 agenda. A lot of people are, are saying, why do we need HS2 now? Um, well, the Midlands have made it very clear. What investors and what communities need more than ever and businesses is certainty. We know that with HS2, it's not just about the connectivity. And by the way, it's not just about connecting to London. It's, we're massively keen to connect better to the North, as Henry and my colleagues in the North know. But we also got a capacity issue. We want more freight on the railway. But it's not just about the railway. It's about what happens around those station hubs, what happens with those communities and towns that would be better connected with the release capacity of HS2. And with that, our councils, our cities, in particular our cities, have got really good plans for growth that uh, are underpinned by the arrival of HS2. So if we start if we start dithering or reviewing or revisiting these kind of investment proposals, it's going to affect hugely in the ability for the supply chain, for businesses and investors to plan ahead, to get the right skills in place, to know that they've got a pipeline that they can rely on and they want indeed to invest on. So um, this is going to be uh, tricky. I'm not saying this is an easy uh, task for any of us, but that's when, uh, as my colleagues in the panel have said, government on its own not going to be able to do this. We're going to have to pull together and we're going to have to have perhaps a more engaging um, approach to um, how we engage with private sector in particular and how we choose investment in the right infrastructure. And when it comes to transport, you have to decarbonize the network, you have to start investing in electric charging infrastructure, you need to start thinking about a much wider range of matters. So opportunity is huge, um, it's just how you focus your efforts and make decisions so people know where you're heading. Fantastic, Maria. Thank you very much. And, and um, we, we're going to return to some of those threads for sure. The, the viewers are starting to ask questions around the, you know, is this the art of the possible that we're, we're talking about, um, given the, the, the financial status of, of, of the country at the moment? Um, so we'll return to that. But before we do, um, uh, Luke, um, at Mock McDonald's, you know, your, your sort of range of expertise is so broad, your, your interests range right across the, the sustainable development goals. Um, but a number of those goals speak to the climate emergency. Uh, and I'd like to ask you how you, in your view, councils can maintain the momentum behind their declarations of, of climate emergency as they move into recovery strands. And, and that's a great question. And uh, obviously there's a, a series of core biosphere goals in the sustainable development goals about life on land and life on water, as well as climate action. I, I think if anything, there's potentially more momentum now um, a, around the climate emergency uh, than, than there was before. You know, there's been a real shock to the system. We've all felt that individually. Uh, it's shocked our systems <laughs> and our systems of systems, but it's shown that behavioural change is possible when you're united against uh, a common purpose. So, um, you know, but there are multiple pathways as we recover from this crisis. I've heard from everybody so far on the call um, about um, a green recovery and the importance of the, of the green agenda. Um, there is a risk that economic recovery could entail a high carbon rebound. Um, and that, that's going to be in contravention of our, our legally binding commitment to carbon reduction. So how do we navigate a low carbon way out that, that's economically advantageous? Um, but supports carbon reduction, that's a tension. Um, but the opportunity with the investment is that actually we start to make great decisions in the short term and in the long term. You know, the Committee on Climate Change said that you need to spend one to 2% of GDP on, um, you know, on, a low, on the transition to a low carbon economy. We are we're gonna be spending big bucks in the uh, re recovery from COVID. And actually, if we are smart in that, you know, Maria's already mentioned it, um, we can decarbonize at the same time. We can create green jobs. We, we can um, contribute to the leveling up agenda. And I think what's great about the SDGs as a common language, uh, is actually they're all about inequality. You know, it's not just about the economy. <laughs> it's not just about the environment. It's about inequality. And that is a 
big issue, it's very visible at the moment, uh, there's been some big conversations going on um, about equality and actually, you know, the, 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 SD, the impact of COVID has been uneven, uh, hasn't it? And, and um, the impacts of climate change are going to be uneven as well. Uh, but we've learned lessons about community response, uh, the importance of local decision making. Um, we, we talk, we've learned lessons about behavioural change, the role of government regulation, the need for action based on science. Um, so I think, you know, we come back to momentum. De decarbonizing transport is a big issue and people are starting to want to do more walking, make more space for active modes of travel, those kinds of things. Um, you know, we've, we've, we're seeing in many of our core cities, um, you know, pop-up cycle lanes um, and, you know, park and pedal rides schemes being proposed, all of these kind of things that are short-term responses. Um, but we've, we've got an opportunity to start embedding in our recovery planning, uh, the opportunity to overlay our response to the climate crisis on that so that actually we get to the sustainable future that, that the, the UN SDGs um, articulate uh, in a way that so many people connect with. And, and that's what I think is why they're a great language for this because people connect individually, but they apply nationally, uh, regionally, locally, and, um, and they are this inclusive, holistic big picture. Um, and we don't want, you know, as a society, people to be left behind. So yeah a big opportunity for um, injecting momentum we've got cop 26 coming up uh you know it's been it's been delayed there's momentum in uh you know in the build-up to that this is the the decade of action declared by the un and actually what we if the global events have shown that we we have the opportunity to take great action now so we just need to seize that um in uh, in all of our regions Thanks very much, Luke. Um, seize the day. But um, the, the phrase that you, you mentioned then that, that, um, that resonated with me was, we've we got, we got to spend big bucks. Um, and I want to ask um, the, the, the panel, um, or, or put to the panel, the question being asked by viewer Robert Purton, which is, you know, are we dealing here with the art of the possible? Are there big bucks to spend? Um, we're moving from fighting the, the first wave of, of COVID. There's likely to be huge pressure to boost the NHS, to catch up on the backlog of you know, 10 million odd operations. We've got Brexit coming and the tapering down of government e economic support and uh, the beginning of paying, paying back uh, the huge national debt. So are, are we looking at, at green growth or a decade of austerity, uh, another decade of austerity? Uh, James, what, what's, what's your view? I think in terms of looking about how we finance some of the changes coming forward. I think, and I touched on it a little bit in my introduction, I think around, um, it is looking for non-traditional means of financing public services and public investment. So um, again, I've talked about it a little bit. We, uh, in, in Leeds, we're looking at launching a municipal green bond scheme. So people, rather than um, investing in an ISA or, a, a, um, 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 or through a traditional financial institution, will be able to invest in um, a municipal green bond, which we would use to uh, put towards um, uh, clean energy generation. So that's just an example of looking beyond sort of some traditional means. I think in terms of the, um, uh, in terms of things like devolution, like I said, you know, there is a commitment in our devolution deal around some of the traditional government um, um, funding, look, looking at delegating that down to may mayoral areas. Um, and I do believe there is a, um, um, as Brexit um, as Brexit comes forward, and 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 again, I'm I was really interested in what you said, Toby. Nobody's talking about Brexit. I'm thinking blindly, it's six months away. Um, it is, you know, we have been promised shared prosperity funds and, and other things like that, so that the money that the European Union uh, distributed was distributed by our national government. And again, that um, they've got to, I think, maintain their commitment to doing that because a lot of our work. Um, around employment, around reaching people outside the labour market, has been funded by the European Union. And also, I think, again, it, it, it's, it's about, um, as people may, uh, as individual consumers may make a lot of different choices as a result of lockdown, you know, are people going to be looking at um, 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 less traditional working methods and things like that? Um, how, how will that, um, how will that change the economy? How, and, and, and where can we look at opportunities there. I, I, I mean, I agree with the question that, you know, the, the, the strain on the public finance, on the national public finances is going to be, um, um, is going to be huge, but um, we've been here, um, um, we've been 
or, there's always a risk sometimes in national finances, people hear big numbers. Um, and, 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 and actually the reality is, um, we've been we um, we've been here before, and I do think it is a question around how the resources the government had are distributed, and how, like I say, we can look for new and maybe less traditional forms of finance. Yeah, interesting stuff. Um, so, so I'm going to be it, it, perhaps unfairly. I'm going to leap across to Henry and 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 put the the, the same question to you, Henry, on the basis that um, you know your 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 chair is the architect of austerity. Do you, do you, do you have a view on on um, on whether the focus is going to be on paying back the debt or the focus is going to be on on, on growth uh, and investment? So I think I think the interesting prospect, isn't it, is you can only spend money once. So you're going to have to to tax people more and or cut spending in this climate the the, the kind of the, the the kind of laws of geography mean that you can't continue borrowing ad infinitum not just the laws of economics because there's just just isn't a, a credible approach now who bears the cost of those tax rises in the longer term and who benefits from the investment you still make is clearly the the choice you have to make and i think around decarbonization I don't think it's a choice between enabling us to deal with the societal divisions that this kind of crisis has highlighted. So the, the gap between the most vulnerable in our society and some of the most financially disadvantaged and the rest of the population or the environmental concerns. So that environmental social justice lens around our capital investment, I think, is really critical. And I think that's where devolution, decentralisation are really important because you can make some much more nuanced policy uh, innovations and interventions when you take that lens so fuel poverty is a social problem well actually often solutions to dealing with fuel poverty have significant decarbonization benefits and so i think the kind of energy space i think is particularly important because it has both economic and social issues that relate to the environmental reality and so how you decarbonize in a way that brings people with you and demonstrates the social justice dimension i think is really critical so we would say technologies like carbon capture use and storage building small modular reactors in reality those will generate profit to the uk if you can get, make the the economic case for doing them such that the government creates the certainty and the initial investment to make them happen and so that you can only tax businesses that are successful generating value in the economy if you want to be a world leader in decarbonization not just have the wind turbines but build the islands in the north sea that you build them from so you capture the economic value rather than giving it to people the other side of the the north sea that those are political and economic choices and i think we have to be absolutely clear that we want to capture the value from decarbonisation, whether those be manufacturing jobs or the benefits for communities in terms of closing the challenge, challenging circumstances people live in, rather than doing these things in splendid isolation. And I think examples for how we've in the past pursued uh, greening our energy and our electricity system in particular have not necessarily taken the lens of industrial policy. And that's a massive mistake because actually for the north of England, we earn a lot of our value in the economy from generating electricity and, and other energy. So we have got to be able to build the, the, the nuclear reactors here, not just have nuclear power. And I think that that dimension, the Midlands is very similar around, for instance, battery technology, where I know there's huge industrial strength and, and positioning there that will be really valuable to the UK. So it's not a particular argument to the North, but I think in terms of how our cities <laughs> respond, I, I think that the, the reality is you can't disconnect the economic recovery and decarbonisation from one another. We can't pay for two different journeys and, and neither of those journeys can ignore the fact that actually if you have a, a, a lack of uh, benefit to those who have not done well from previous deindustrialization and have not fared well in this crisis, that you're not going to keep public consent for investing in long-term decisions because those long-term decisions have to have immediate and longer-term benefits for the whole of society and how you tell that story i think is absolutely critical that's why people like james are the best people and sam the best people to talk along with our yeah. metro mayors for instance about those tough choices because they need to present those integrated solutions rather than those silo policies that just nuzzle in and say well we like this technology or this idea and that's why when it comes to something like smr okay. technology we'll build those in the north for government don't do that in whitehall give yeah. us the investment and the certainty that the, the country needs it and we'll build them for you and we'll put them wherever you want them but the, what we really want is the jobs building them not just the electricity that comes from them and we've spent 20 30 years in britain not caring enough 
about the industrial policy implications of government decision making. I think our city regions and local authorities are fixing that. Central government needs to empower us to take that lens and not make short term decisions, which then have longer term pain attached to them. Fair um, enough. Fair down. enough, Henry. Thank you. That, uh, very, very clearly put. And there's two strands that I want to I want to take out of that. Um, firstly, over over to Councillor Webster. Um, Sam, um, just to pick up on the point about public confidence, really, uh, Matthew Jellings has, has asked this, um, our, our viewer, um, also encouraging uh, everything you're saying is encouraging, he says, but doesn't recovery depend on public confidence in safe working environments and, and re will recovery be be hindered and, and held back if that confidence is missing and, and perhaps you'd like to to put that in with with Henry's uh, point about uh, the public having confidence in recovery as a whole in, in, in uh, the, the, the sharing of the benefits from growth as a whole. <coughs> Well, there's a, there's a few things there. Of, of course, it's important that people feel safe in their working environments. <clears throat> I think we've seen, you know, uh, changing behaviours, doing things this way, for instance, that some of those changes will, will stick. Um, and some of them, people are desperate to kind of get back together and get back to how things were before as well. So there's, there's a mix of stuff going on. Um, but yeah, there's a role for uh, employers to make sure they're their sites are safe and, and, and trade unions um, and all that as well. But I think there's another factor, which is do the general population feel safe doing things that they used to do? So I've, I've just done an interview about the non-essential uh, retailers reopening on Monday, some of them. And I think that, you know, it's going to take time for everything's not going to be back to normal next week. It's going to take a, lot, a long time for people to feel safe and want to do certain things. You, know, you think about your own circumstances. Do you want to go on holiday even if you're allowed to? Do you want to go out shopping in a clothes shop even if you're allowed to? You have to want to do these things. And I think to want to do them, you have to feel as though it's an experience again and that it feels safe. So there's a, there's a role there for local authorities and for other regulatory authorities and, and for government as well. But things are not going to get back to normal anytime soon. It's going to take a period of time. And yesterday I wrote to the Secretary of State for Business saying that I'm not quite sure that governments <clears throat> realised, or maybe they have, but maybe they don't have the firepower, maybe they used it a bit too soon. They're going to have to support businesses over the coming weeks and months as they go through this recovery phase, especially in you know things like retail, hospitality, leisure, some of those very visible sectors. Um, to us, they're going to have to provide ongoing support to some of those businesses, otherwise lots of them will fail. If you think about small independent business, any reduction in footfall, them having to um, practice social distancing measures and safety measures within their business, they cannot bear the costs of that or the loss of trade for any significant period of time. So I think that the government needs to think about recovery grants, another phase of business support and intervention, otherwise I think all we'll see is a delayed uh, recession and delayed um, lots of people being laid off in the future. It didn't happen in the first few months necessarily, although a lot of people have lost their jobs already. But lots more will if the government doesn't come forward with another package of interventions. So I think I would encourage them to do that. You said that we sounded very positive about things and I'm not positive about everything at all. I'm, I'm quite realistic about some of the things. I think there are challenges, there are opportunities, but I also don't think we should con ourselves that things are okay because things are not okay. This is the biggest economic hit that any of us have um, gone through in our lifetimes, any, anybody in living memory. Um, lots of people will lose their jobs. And if we're talking about things that are over here, um, just green recovery and green jobs and sustainable growth and the United Nations and all that kind of stuff. It's very easy to lose the connection with ordinary people who are just affected by they've lost their job, they don't have as much money as they did, their bills are going up, they're finding it really difficult to cope with day-to-day -day life. So we've got to key into that as well and make sure we're speaking to um, you know, large parts of the population that are really struggling at the moment and how are we going to help those people in the immediate future. Thanks very much, uh, Sam. I mean, it's a really interesting point you put there. And, and one of our questions uh, has been asked anonymously, which is to be expected with a, a question about Brexit, perhaps. But um, there's a question there about Brexit assisting with green growth. Um, how will it assist with uh, economic recovery and, and, and telling the response 
regionally. And I, I wonder if the, the, the slightly more interesting question might be that our experience of going through the referendum for Brexit and the whole process of the, of the last few years might inform uh, how we talk to people, engage with people and, and, and um, develop a consensus around what recovery should be. And, and, and that's the way to bring in the, the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. They have to be talked about in a way that isn't imposing them on, on, on people. Um, and perhaps that's a lesson that we, we might have learned over the last few years. Um, and, and Maria, um, maybe you'd like to pick up on, on some of those threads and, and also answer the question that, um, that affects public transport post-COVID, post I think, which is, you know, when are people actually going to feel like they want to get on a train again? I mean, I've got a, a friend who went into central London from the suburbs uh, last week at uh, 10 a.m., which is now part of the rush hour, and had a carriage to himself. You know, pe people just aren't getting on trains. So, so, so when, when is that change going to happen, do you think? So um, it is it's, it's shocking, isn't it? I mean, here I am, the most sort of advocate for public transport, and I'm myself thinking, do I need to really travel? You know, um, so we are, but we're seeing this across the globe. We're not, this is not a UK thing. And that's what I do say, this is an opportunity to think, um, you know, in the longer term, we need to work together as, as a whole, because whatever we come up with in terms of how we sell the importance of public transport, we want to do it across, the, you know, a, a larger, as much larger geography area as possible. But picking up on Councillor Webster's point, um, I think the use of public transport is going to be so related to the now and what happens around in our towns and cities. So a lot of the people are, um, first of all, they want to feel safe, absolutely. And I know the, tra the transport operators are working extremely hard to think about how that they create that environment in, 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 in that way. So people feel confident about using it, knowing that the system, the measures are there in place for them to feel safe. Um, now, that is the now, and that is an issue that it will be, a, 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 a have to be very patient. I think, you know, we cannot, um, we cannot predict when people will feel confident. That that's gonna have to be in association in, in so many other social matters. You know, what happens to our towns and cities, how people will feel confident about going shopping or going to work. That's what, that's what will generate. It's not just the mode of transport, it's what the destination is, what's the purpose of the trip and how safe they feel also in doing that, in that, you know, what the purpose of the trip is itself. So, so public transport, and we cannot do this in isolation. We've got to work, and this is when the cities are so important because the cities are the ones who have been hit the hardest in this particular matter and in terms of how you think about the future use of office the future use of recre recreation um you know retail and 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 how long is it going to take for people to feel confident and what the new normal might look like you know i know that there's a lot of people who are thinking of the experience of their con consumer when they actually go into the shop um how much will be in terms of size and space and so there is a lot going on at the moment that we cannot just look at public transport in isolation and uh, i just again have faith that people will eventually want to interact and to and to invest in 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 places and 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 my suggestion is empowering local authorities to do that place making agenda at the moment, it's gonna be really important to give them the freedom. They know the town, the places, they know their communities, to give them the opportunity to shape those high streets that were already struggling before COVID, let alone now, is gonna be extremely important because that's what will get people to travel on public transport to reach to those places or to jobs in those places. So place making is gonna be hugely important uh, for the cities. That's a good point, Maria. And we, we've, um, we've had uh, a, a couple of sessions now on um, developing tools for local authorities to help high streets recover and, and, and lots of talk about case studies of, of uh, public sector interventions on the high street and, and you, can, you can catch up on those, um, those webinars on the voiceofauthority.co.uk um, and we'll be continuing that stream but um, let's, let's bring this back to, to Green Growth Luke. Um, you, you, you've got uh, wide experience across across the country. Can you can you talk a little about what lessons Westminster might take from from local authorities on how to deliver green growth? I think um, you know the, the, 
the point that's already been made about connecting it to local people and local issues is really important. So it can't just be a hypothetical that, oh, you know, we aspire to these wonderful things, these UN goals. Uh, we've signed up to this internationally, the Paris Agreement, this, this ethereal thing. It has to be connected to where people live and, and what people do. And I think what we're starting to see uh, in, in um, moving forward from the climate emergencies that have been declared are those pathways to it and consultations to it. So I think, um, you know, framing it around re relevant local questions are really important. So um, I'll take the example from the Midlands, you know, I, I'm based in Birmingham, uh, the Combined Authority, West Midlands Combined Authority, um, earlier in the year consulted on their, their uh, WM 2041 kind of green green paper, green recovery paper. Um, in fact, they went aboard uh, last week and they've you know, accepted this is how we're going to do the green recovery. And what it is, it's connected to local issues. Um, it is, it's that bridge between uh, ambition and policy and places and people. And I think that's the connection that, that, um, that core cities have, have got the opportunity. You know, it is this time of um, lockdown has made people really appreciate their local spaces uh, and also to see where uh, they need to be better connected you know and so we the, what um what regions and uh, cities can do uh, and what westminster can learn from is about rethinking the value of of places uh, for people and for and for the environment because you know our societies you know we, you know, we exist within planetary boundaries uh, we have got a physical environments around us and i think you know um social isolation has highlighted the need to think about the spaces we create for people to be together um, and that that means housing that means places that means the public realm um, you know g gateways into public transport but also if people aren't traveling to places how, how are their how are their local networks connected uh, and not just transport networks but their their green networks their blue networks you know and this you know this is where we've already been talking about the need for integrated solutions not kind of silo policies and um i, I don't think it's enough anymore uh, unless this is something maybe westminster could could learn i don't think it's enough just to articulate you know um there's we've got a transport problem and therefore we need a transport solution we've got a social problem and we need a social solution Th these things all overlap and actually it's about people um you know it's about social outcomes in, in the end um we are a gr we are citizens and we we need to you know it's maslow's hierarchy of needs we need to feel safe we need to have housing all of that kind of stuff um i think what what the sdgs do uh, since we're talking about this is that they give us a language to to demonstrate that people focus solutions that, that em embody a wide range of issues and so I think, um, you know, if we're talking about the green recovery, it is, it's framed not just in this is good for the environment uh, or this is because there's some scary climate emergency out there. It's framed around this is good for you because uh, it's going to make you feel better. You've got nicer places around you and you can do better work that makes you feel good. Uh, and I think those are some some themes we can we can continue to explore. Yeah, that's a that's a sensible way to address that sort of engagement issue as well, perhaps. But but is, is there a sort of elephant in the room that's coming out of this conversation, um, and, and one that's being um, pointed pointed out by uh, a, a viewer as well that um, that perhaps one of the things that COVID nineteen has done has changed our views of what what cities are for. And ca ca Councillor Lewis, you know, it, are, are cities. Are cities are going to be as popular as they were? Um, has the role of cities changed? It's a really good question. I think in the short term, we're going to see a, a, a centre-like Leeds, uh, which has been very uh, driven by retail and food and drink, um, is going to see a huge change in the short term as um, um, less, people, um, um, less people want to go out to eat or drink or shop and um, those businesses that um, work on, on, on people that go to an office or, or work in the city centre, going for lunch or a coffee or a pint after work, um, see a lot less uh, um, 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 people in the city centre. I still, think, I still think cities are going to have a role. And you know, we've been, um, um, the decline of a high street, I think, has been a, 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 a theme running through um, um, a lot of urban and um, planning thinking for a very, very long time. And I think we may see an acceleration of that. And what that will require is an acceleration of how we think about actually what is a city centre that's not um, um, a city centre for the sort of first time for 150 years, maybe not dominated by retail. How do we, um, 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 how do we look at um, actually 
if people are more focused on sustainable transport, is there a shift to residential in, in, in city centres? Um, is there a shift to city centres as um, maybe a meeting place if people aren't going to the office five days a week? How will people go to the office? Um, but I, I, I do think as, a, a, um, um, as transport interchanges and as meeting places, cities still have a role, but it is going to be very different. And I think coming from, just coming from a, um, um, a council perspective, um, just coming from a council perspective, actually the way we um, assume things like business rates, income, which, which is hugely important for supporting our service delivery is going to have to change. How we think about planning policy um, is going to, um, um, is going to uh, have to change as well. And I suspect this may accelerate that. What I would say just on the other side of that, so um, my ward is four ex mining villages right on the out, about as far away from the city centre as you can get, but still be in the Leeds Council area. And actually, we may, you know, we may see if people are more working from home, we may see the village high street rejuvenate in a, um, um, in a, different, um, in a different way. And people, you know, if, if people aren't travelling to work, actually, they might um, stroll up to their local high street for the weekly shop. Uh, rather than stopping at the supermarket on the drive or commute home from work, so it's it, it is um, around uh, it, it is around that big section of the economy and, and, and retail and hospitality is such a huge um, uh, such a huge employer in terms of the number of people employed and uh, such a huge employer of people, frankly, who are um, 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 are on low incomes and and, and and seriously affected by these changes. It's really going to have to get to grip of, even if we don't have the answers now. Absolutely. And, and, and of course, um, uh, former mining villages are sitting on uh, potentially new energy sources. We've been hearing this week uh, about the use of water uh, running through former mines uh, to, to heat, um, to, to fuel um, energy um, uh, heat, uh, heat districts. Um, that, that was a sort of innovation that's being that's coming through now. So, so maybe you're sitting on a, a sort of greening, um, a, a greening factor there. Um, Councillor Webster, would you like to, to pick up on any of those? I, I, I would assume that you concur with that, and and the, and the sort of villages of, of Nottinghamshire may, may may benefit in just just the same way as in, in Yorkshire. Well, that's one of the big differences with the city of Nottingham and the city of Leeds. I think that uh, our boundary is very 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 tight. So. Um, we are largely in a very urban uh, area. Um, and I live in the city centre. I'm assuming James lives uh, out in his uh, ward uh, outside of the city centre. I actually live in, in Nottingham city centre. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I understand and share some of those views. I think things are going to change. I think we, we, we kind of understood these things were going to change anyway. Um, so our investment, for instance, in, in Nottingham Castle as a, um, a, a hospitality and leisure destination, a visitor attraction, um, that reopens next next year in early 2021, and they, they estimate about 400,000 visitors to the site each year. So I think you know visitor visitor economy is very important to us. I think the food and beverage and people wanting to get together in that way will will return not not uh, in the same way for a period of time so we will have to review our our city center strategy um, i've also seen over you know recent years um huge rises in the proportion of people wanting to live in a, in a city center area and i actually I, I do think that will continue but city centers need to be attractive places they need to be not dominated by cars they need to be places that people want to be and spend time in they need to be um, destinations uh, in their own right and I think there's, there's elements of that in lots of our big cities already um, but I think we could do more and that goes back I suppose to the the place making the investment in in, in uh, green infrastructure physically greening city centres you know our residents constantly ask for more green space more kind of urban parks pocket parks places that they can be and sit and relax I think we need to do more of that as well as, as part of the same agenda. It sounds like a, a straightforward and simple thing, but it, it's something that people really want to happen. Thank you, Councillor. And, and, and it's, it's last word to you, uh, I'm, I'm afraid, because we've come to the, the end of the session. Um, and I'm going to take those last words as, as we could do more. 
um, I think I think well well said. Um, thank you to all of our panelists for for sparing their time today. I'm sorry we couldn't uh, delve into all of these questions with um, more of you over more time, but um, we we uh, everybody's time is under such pressure uh, these days. What we will do is we will take uh, questions that we haven't managed to answer today and put them to our panel. And if we could kindly ask them to respond um, by email over the next few hours and couple of days, we'll relay their responses over social media channels so that we can keep this conversation going because um, it's an important one and it's uh, raised more questions than it's answered uh, so far as, as so many things do uh, during this time. Um, so in the meantime, it remains to say thank you, uh, particularly to Mott McDonald, uh, who made this conversation possible. Uh, thank you to Luke for, for taking part in the conversation. Thank you to Henry, to Maria, to uh, Sam and to James for sparing their time to take part. Thank you also, of course, to our viewers um, for your attention and, and for the probing questions. Um, and uh, thank you uh, to um, uh, my team for uh, assembling uh, such a fantastic panel under the, uh, the stressful conditions that we're all working under uh, these days. You'll find a video uh, of this session at the voiceofauthority.co.uk uh, tomorrow. Uh, and a report will be up shortly, which will detail the results of all the polls uh, and uh, some summaries of, of what our speakers have said. Don't forget the next session on Tuesday, 8.30 a.m., how changes to the way we consume culture are affecting places and vice versa. Uh, until then, goodbye from our panel, uh, goodbye from me and from everyone at Three Fox. Thank you very much.